Hey everyone, how is it going? How was the day? It was packed, right? Yeah. So, but I have a bad news for you. It's uh, probably the talk with the biggest number of slides <laughs> and the biggest number of features uh, showed. So let's uh, let's start directly. Um, let's 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 move. Yeah. So I'm. Uh, who, who, who was at the URP talk this afternoon, just to know? Uh, okay, so I might re repeat myself. So I'm, I'm uh, Matthew Miller, product manager for uh, HDRP and URP, so SRPs. And I've been uh, working for 22 years uh, in the real-time industry as, a, as an engine programmer and then a tools programmer and moved to Unity nine years ago. Uh, field engineer, um, product manager for film and animation after that. And I'm Remy. I've been working um, with Unity for more than 14 years now um, in multiple industries, wearing different hats. Uh, we're 3D artist, uh, developer, product manager, etc. And I've joined Unity four years ago as a quality engineer, and I'm now a technical artist in SRPs. So yeah, as uh, if you were at the URP talk, I will repeat the same. But you know, like 10 years ago, uh, we introduced Unity 5, and um, it took like two, three to five years so that everybody is using it and, every, and the, the pipeline majors and the, the tools major. And then we, we started to introduce SRPs like about five years ago, I would say. And same thing, you know, like a good product comes with like good shipped games and content. So um, we've like, it's just a small, uh, uh, a small set of examples of what has been uh, done with Unity. Um, have you actually, who, like right hand if you know the game and left and both hands if you played it, just to see if it works, right? Right hand if you know, both hands if you played. Okay, so Sons of the Forest, who played? Oh, well, played and okay, cool. You can shout if you loved it also. Um, I Am Fish, not many. Oh, that's sad. It's a good game. Um, Slime Rancher 2. Okay. Mm. Uh, Lego Builder's Journey, just to see. Okay. Oh, you like it's a, if you have kids also, it's a beautiful play to a beautiful game to play with kids, and there is a URP version for mobile, and HDRP for the PC and consoles using ray tracing. Uh, Hot Space Ship Breaker. Okay, pretty cool. Um, and also, it's not just been used uh, with uh, games. Actually, at, at the beginning of HDRP, we had a lot of non-gaming projects uh, for ArcVis. This one I really love. It's kind of disgusting, <laughs> but um, it's it's uh, it's it's a beautiful. Like uh, actually, the the usage is great. It's Viertamed. Uh, it's a company who is doing uh, uh, surgery simulators. So you know, you know, you just cut a little piece now, and you put uh, a small camera in the body and all the pieces, and you can operate without taking days to come back. Um, and and so they entirely simulate the entire of the body with a uh, with the HDRP, and it looks. Beautiful and, and strange, um, and then uh, a lot of product configurators also. Like there was a big usage in uh, in automotive. By the way, who is working in the game industry here? Okay, in uh, like non-game Argvis Medical. Oh wow, a lot of you. Oh, yes. that's really nice. And well, and um, who, who works in film animation? Nobody. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But we did a lot of things, um, and some like a lot of people don't know. But for example, there is a, a TV series. It's one minute sh shorts on, on French television. They made 400 episodes rendered in HDRP, which is crazy. Uh, Baymax Dreams also, uh, which was on, on uh, Disney TV. Uh, Treasure Tracker says season one and two, and Journey to Orioleon, which was on theater. Uh, and there are like a, a few more TV series uh, coming entirely rendered in Unity uh, in HDRP. So, um, so yeah, as I mentioned also in the in the previous talk, if you if you are on YouTube, you can watch the other talk. Um, the so like when I when I was talking to studios as a field engineer, what was coming always was like built-in render pipeline is a black box. It's neither really optimized for high end. It's neither really optimized for mobile. And then uh, as an artist, you have to assemble everything to have your things right. So that's. When we, we come here uh, now, you know, like uh, with Unity 6, we have scriptable render pipelines to open this black box. 
and then two pipelines, one dedicated, optimized for mobile with maximum reach and, 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 and um, customizability, and then HDRP with all the off-the-shelf features that we will present now, uh, and totally optimized for, um, for these architectures. Um, let's let's skip this one. So yes, of course, yeah, we we don't support all the all the platforms so far. Uh, as a, we we just uh, PC consoles and um, just PC consoles and PS uh, VR two. So I wanted to show why it's highly optimized for uh, uh, for uh, high-end devices. So first, from so from left to right, um, from CPU to the final pixels. So it's optimized for uh, CPU performance. So we optimize the volume system uh, in HDRP. Uh, we also made it first-class citizen so that it's shared across URP. So it's really nice because to make it work on URP, we had to optimize it, which is C CPU gains for HDRP users. Uh, it's a highly parallelized light loop, leveraging bursts and dots, uh, and jobs, sorry. Uh, the SRP batcher, uh, the GP resident drawer that we uh, presented this morning, and sitting on top of also DirectX 12, which is now out of preview, we split graphics jobs so that you can send uh, faster the, your, your jobs, your graphics jobs to the GPU. Then it's optimized geometry now with, in Unity 6 with the uh, GPU occlusion culling. You've seen this morning the, the rock in the front, so it's just kind of magically removing everything which is curled based on what was here the, the, the previous frame. You will talk more about it very quickly. Um, it's optimized lighting. Also, the idea was like on this, on this market segment, you are building worlds with a lot of lights very often. And so we want this to be very efficient with a, a render pipeline, which is a mix of tiled and cluster based, so that when you evaluate the lights, you minimize the number of objects that you are affecting. Um, and then it's entirely written on compute, almost uh, on, on the GPU side. So it's compute light loop, uh, compute rendering features, post effects, uh, volumetrics, clouds, water, uh, and particles with VFX graph. And finally, when you get all these features running together, of course, at 4K, it's kind of hard to make them run at 60 FPS. So what you do in general, you use dynamic resolution and upscalers. And we, we've been already partnering, partnering for some time to integrate state-of-the-art upscalers, so uh, FSR uh, by AMD, then the LSS2. So we will have FSR2 coming to Unity 6, the LSS3, and also, the problem is like you you can have you can choose. It's great to be able to choose different upscalers, but we really wanted to have a good one that you can fall back on that works across all the platforms, and that's uh, the STP upscaler, so special temporal post processing, that is coming to Unity 6. So yeah, I really wanted to focus one last time on free optimization that Mathieu was talking about. Um, the first one is an optimization of the CPU, which is basically using DOT's batch render group uh, for game object, and there is a link there because there is a really nice uh, blog post uh, about it if you don't know what batch render group is. Um, basically what that does is just, um, it's a new way to transfer a static object from the CPU to the GPU. So the more instance you have on your game, uh, the better. Then we have what we call the GPU occlusion calling, which is a GPU optimization, uh, which is basically not drawing uh, vertices affecting no pixel. And to do that, it uses uh, the depth buffer and uh, the result of the CPU frost on calling as an input. So that means overall that you have just less vertices, so you can put actually more for the same, for the same price. Uh, next slide, please. Yes. And lastly, this is another GPU optimization, which is called STP, which is our uh, brand new internal dynamic resolution algorithm. Uh, it's a temporal upscaler, meaning that it will render the frame at a the fraction of the target resolution. Uh, so here, for example, 50%. And then it will use accumulation, so data from previous frame, and then the, 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 the neighboring pixels to basically guess the missing information. So as you can see here, uh, we use a rather aggressive percentage, so 50%. That means we only render one pixel out of four, basically. And it's honestly hard to see the difference. And lastly, those three optimization uh, are cross-pipeline and cross-platform, as long as your platform supports uh, Compute Shader. And I really wanted to insist on one thing. Those are just optimization. Uh, so you don't really need to know anything. You don't really need to change your project, etc. They're basically just checkboxes. Um, so you get those gain basically for, for free. <coughs> 
So yeah, just a disclaimer, like the image you see of the demo this morning, because Vess is going to kill me, the director. It's, it was done before the final uh, content, so if you see the quality difference, it's, uh, it's just that we, we prepared these slides before. Um, so, uh, so as the mission of, of HDRP is really to take every single artist in the, in the, in the production pipeline and have, like, give them the, the tools that they need. So for lighters, uh, first, it's physical light you need, you know, so you, you will be able to choose the exact real value of your lights matching the real physical value, so like the sun, which would be 130,000 lumen when it's uh, at midday and, and, and 400 lumen when it's at, uh, uh, at 8 p.m., let's say. Uh, but the problem we had at the beginning is like not everybody knows you know how many lumen or lux you should put on lights. So you have like these little icons which helps you choose. Like you have a small candle. If it's a candle, you have a bulb and so on. So it's pretty easy to use. And if you use HDRP, don't like don't try to mess around with lighting. Like use a real value so that they match together, right? Um, for example, if you put a light bulb in the daylight, if it doesn't generate light, it's because in in the daylight you don't see any light from a bulb uh, when you're outdoor. Um, you have advanced light controls uh, and advanced lights. So, for example, you have real-time area lights with real-time area light shadows. Uh, but you have also a lot of advanced light controls. Like, for example, you can choose if you want a light to affect only diffuse or only affect specular. So, if you want uh, to, to tweak your, your, uh, your look, you have advanced uh, settings for all the lights. Uh, so, for example, the, the, the spotlight, you can have a box projector so that it, it simulates a kind of a sunlight if you want. Um, which is great also for, for lighting characters in cinematics. You, do I miss one, uh, some? No, I think yeah. that's good. If I find uh, some more. Uh, rendering layers also, uh, and so they were called lighting layers. And the idea was to say, you know, we, n we never have enough layers in Unity. So we were like, for rendering, we should have our dedicated ones. And uh, we used to have eight for lights and eight for decals. And then for and then URP uh, took that idea of having also the like we took that idea like we 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 said hey let's have this also in in uh, URP and then say ah oh, it would be better to have more layers and shareable so then now we have rendering layers which are common to the two pipelines um, where you can choose uh, for us uh, between 16 layers and you affect them as as uh, as you want. Um, we have advanced shadows uh, with a lot of uh, parameters. You can have cache shadows, so you can, you can cache them, you can make them update only on the moving objects, which will just cache the shadows on top of the, uh, which, which will cast the shadows on, the, on top of the cached shadows. Um, you have a lot of advanced filtering also, like PCSS, uh, where you can control the, the smoothness of, of, the, of the shadow, and uh, you can tint the shadows. You can choose a penumbra, also if there is a penumbra or not. Or not. Um, and yeah, so so tons of control here. And uh, the hero feature is of course volumetric fog lighting, which again is integrated with almost all the other components. So for example, in light, for each light, you can override how it affects uh, the volumetrics to to tweak your look. If you want to know more about lighting specifically, there is this great talk. Like everybody. We should walk that, watch that talk, um, achieving high fidelity uh, graphics with HDRP. And then when, like, once you, when the lighter has done its job, he just wants to have the best uh, looking visuals, but of course, depending on your platform, you cannot afford everything. So the idea with almost every feature that we do is to have, um, uh, to have fallbacks, you know, from the top to the bottom. So for example, um, you will uh, have APVs that I will talk about, and then, uh, you, or you could have a mix of light map and light pros, which would, could be cheaper. Uh, for reflections, you have ray trace reflections, which can fall back to screen space reflections, which can fall back to reflection probes, uh, which could fall back to the sky. Um, and then same for global illumination, ray trace global illumination, screen space global illumination, APVs, and then uh, the sky uh, in the worst case. For, um, for shadows, it's the same thing, it's a stack. You have uh, shadows, so um, ray trace shadows. And then you have shadow maps and cascade shadows. And then, because usually you never have enough resolution for the contact, you can put contact shadows on top of it. And if you have a texture with normal maps, we can simulate the shadows inside of these textures. For example, if you have grass or, or rocks with uh, micro shadows. And then you have, of course, uh, ambient occlusion, again, uh, that you can add on top. 
And so as, as I was mentioning, um, we have a lot of people using also HDRP to render out in the end. So you have a, something interactive and you want to render out very high quality frames. If you make cinematics, product configurators, and so on. And this is rendered in HDRP. Uh, so you just take your scene, just one volume, pass tracing. And as you can see, a lot of, almost all of the, most of the features, I would say, of HDRP are supported, like the depth of field. You could see the volumetrics, the lens flares. Uh, all the, mat like, the materials are also compatible. Now in Unity, uh, recently we added uh, decal support, and we'll talk about that. And it looks just phenomenal. And it's also nice for a lighter to have like a very a perfect, uh, uh, like a perfect reference. Or if you're coding your own shaders also, like uh, you can also uh, use the pass tracer as a reference. That's what we use, for example, for our hair shader. Um, and then if you want to go even further, you can export AOVs, which are the different passes that uh, HDRP has done so, so that you can do compositing. And when you make a movie out of Unity, uh, we, when we worked with Disney uh, for the Baymax Dream episodes, the, like when we wanted to broadcast them, the problem with real time was not the visual quality, but the motion blur. Because people, like they like to have a good motion blur, which looks like a cinematic, like a cinematic one. And the real time one is based on motion vectors and is, is very approximate. So when you use the Unity recorder, you can activate accumulation motion blur, which will just accumulate the, the, the motion blur at the same time as improving the aliasing, so that just when you render the final image, you have the, you have the right motion, the motion, uh, motion blur. Yeah. So, uh, so adaptive pro volumes, we introduced them in, unit in 21, uh, and they've gone a long way. So to be quick, you can use light maps, but usually they are quite long to bake. We have the GPU light mapper, which is improving things, but it's kind of long to bake still. Um, you also you need to have UVs, and then you can add probes, light probes on top of it, but it's not, um, it's not super high quality. It's going to work for small objects. So with APVs, and also you need to place them manually, sorry. And with APVs, because they are high quality, in a lot of cases, it just like it's just enough uh, for to to do the full uh, GI. For in the enemies demo, it was only uh, um, APVs, and uh, for the for the demo we've showed this morning, same no light maps. Uh, so why? So the first thing is like it's good to have probes which are high quality, but you don't want to place them by hand. So there is an automatic placement, which is actually a, 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 an assisted placement. So you you give density volumes, touch-up volumes, and it will kind of respect what you told, like if you want to really influence the way they will be generated, you can. But otherwise, it will just place adaptively all the probes, a lot of them near the walls and a bit less uh, in the open areas. Um, it, it's using like an SDF of your world, so it's not using Collider, so it's really using the geometry, and then it can find if something is inside of a wall and um, and uh, disable that probe, or uh, yeah, disable that probe for you. Or if it's too close to the wall and it could create a leaking, it will push it out uh, for you. Um, and so, why it's better quality? It's because it's per pixel lighting. In URP, we have also per vertex to be more efficient, but uh, for HDRP, it's just per, per pixel lighting. So, for example, you see the car here. Um, like it's composed of different game objects. So, if it's lit with probes. Each uh, part of the car will sample different uh, light probes, like the classical one. With uh, APVs, it will just sample all the probes out, uh, around, and the car will be lit as once, not breaking batching, and having a real good, um, like a real good result. Where if you have a red wall on the side and a green wall there, it will nicely smooth from green to red uh, around. What is great is also like as I mentioned. Is like everything in HDRP is integrated together. So, for example, the APVs will influence uh, the fog volume. So, in the image here, you see that we have a, a red light. It's bouncing on the wall, and then it will actually light the, the volumetric fog in, in red. But then, when you do global illumination, it's not just about uh, diffuse, but it's also about specular. And if you, like if you have a place like this, like a um, uh, a desk, uh, your, if you don't place well your, your, light, your reflection probes, you will have reflections under the table, right? And so normally this reflection is blocked, so traditionally you put a reflection probe under and then you have to blend them. 
with uh, adaptive probe volumes, we have probe normalization, which means that the reflection probes, we use the, light, the APVs to know what they can see so that they can normalize the probe and, and remove the specular aspect under the, the bed or the, 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 the desk. And then um, it supports lighting scenarios, so you can bake multiple bake sets, baking sets and blend between them, as we showed this morning on the, on the demo or add sky occlusion, where it will uh, give you how much uh, of the sky is seen directly or indirectly. Uh, to, to, uh, for example, if you want to create a time of day, it's just you don't need to have multiple uh, baking sets. With just one baking set, uh, you can already have all the contribution of the sky affecting your environment with just one uh, thing and being done at real time. And then, because it's one structure, we, can, we will be able to stream it for you because we control entirely the, the structure of probes. You give us your memory budget and based on the camera on your API, it will, it will just stream in and out uh, the probes for you. So again, there is a very good talk um, uh, at GDC if you want to know more about it. Um, so yeah, as you'll see in the talk, I'll, I'll try to focus on, um, on the improvement uh, that we bring with Unity 6. Um, the first thing we, we've been trying to do is trying to, to bridge the gap uh, between uh, rasterization and retracing. And we've been doing that doing three things, basically. The, the first one is just by adding more support. So we added decal support uh, in pass tracing and retracing. Uh, we also added Tyrant uh, support. <coughs> The second thing we did is trying to create a basically innovative solution uh, to, to, to bridge that gap. Uh, so in HGRP, we already have uh, SSR, which is screen space reflection, uh, which are great. Uh, but if you have uh, off-screen geometry, you don't get reflection. And that's one limitation. Then we already have uh, ray trace reflection, uh, which are already great for off-screen reflection, but not everything is supported, like, for example, uh, Vertex animation are not supported. So what we did is created the, the mixed tracing reflection, which basically gets you the, the best of both worlds. It starts by, by basically using SSR, so remarching. And then when remarching fails, it will fall back on ray tracing. So it will give you basically everything on the frame, as you can see on the, on the image here. And so this is the third, the third thing that we did uh, for ray tracing, is trying to improve its performance. So for example, with mixed tracing, you get a better performance than if you used ray tracing alone, and you also get better results. And lastly, since ray tracing also falls back on APV data, that means you can throw basically less rays, or even have less bounce on, on ray trace global illumination uh, to have basically the same quality, but for, for lower cost. And for example, you can bake the daylight and you can still turn on the TV and it will, like the TV will contribute to GI with SSGI and fall back to the, to the daylight for the, all the rest. So you, you can still have some dynamism for cheap. Um, and so as, as I mentioned again, like, uh, we want everything for also shading artists. So with the lead shader of HDRP, you have like a lot of advanced uh, control like uh, anisotropy, iridescence. Um, you also, we also support uh, light uh, um, transmission, like subsurface scattering and uh, transparency. Um, you, if you go to the package manager and go to, uh, to HDRP and go to samples, wh who is using the samples in the HDRP package here? Three person, okay. Not it's the bad. best thing in the world, and you have to go there after this talk. No, uh, when you come back. Um, and you have beautiful samples showing, like a lot of shadow graph samples showing how to do all, every kind of uh, materials, and you can directly reuse this in your, in your productions. Uh, we have Stacklit to simulate uh, w the, the effect of different kind of materials with different properties laying, layering on top of each other, which is great for all automotive applications, typically, or all cars. Um, we have tessellation, which we, in general, we don't recommend that much for games because it's very expensive. But for many applications, it's really cool. Here, it's, um, it's one of the TV series which is in production, where they, they just, like, all the characters have these uh, uh, handmade uh, sweaters and so on, and they just use tessellation to have the, the high quality for the, for the film. We have advanced transparency that Remy will touch on, and uh, material variants. Do you use material variants here? You will use mat wow, second best feature in the world. <laughs> um, you know, it's like it's, it's the fact that you you can you can manage your materials like you manage your prefabs. So you can have a, a master material, which, for example, if you have a tune shader, has all the tune parameters, which is which are proper to the programmer and the style. And then you can have the artist facing um, parameters like color and so on, 
where this, the, the one at the top will be locked, and then you can inherit from this and just color the things. If you have a change at the top, you can propagate it back to everyone and have these changes. It's really useful if you, if you have more than 20 materials in your, in, your, uh, in your game, you should really use that. Um, so yeah, uh, one complicated thing about um, in rasterization is actually trying to know how much light is going through an object. Uh, for that, we already have, um, have a few solutions. So we obviously have ray tracing, uh, but as you might know, it has some limitation. And the first one is not everyone can afford ray tracing. Uh, so the second thing we have is screen space refraction in HDRP, which work pretty great. Uh, but the, the, the caveat is that it has a, fi a fixed thickness, so that means it worked for a uh, small glass pane, for example, or even a cube or sphere. But if you have a more complicated geometry, like, uh, like the dragon here, uh, everything starts to break. So what we, what we did in Unity 6 is add what we call the thickness pass, which basically render the, the screen space thickness of uh, an object in a separate buffer. And uh, the thickness is just the difference between the, the, the back faces and the front faces. And for flat geometry, it also computes the, the overlap count of triangle. So as you can see on the, on, the, on, the, on the debug image, it's completely additive. And it can be used not only for transparent, but also for subsurface scattering. So the palm tree is a little bit darker in the middle because there's more overlap. And I said it was just a pass. Uh, so it's a bit of an advanced feature. Uh, basically, because you have to use this pass in a shader graph uh, to basically create your material. Uh, but it can be as simple as um, plugging the thickness into the thickness of the master stack. And I will actually show you, because I have a version of the, of a, of the project uh, from this morning when I imported the dragon. So here is uh, our uh, screen space refraction with a fixed thickness. So as you can see, uh, by default, um, the, the absorption and the refraction is still the same, so the color is the same uh, everywhere. And as soon as I drop uh, the um, thickness pass material, as you can see in the middle where there is just more material, uh, you get more red and then you get less uh, refraction and absorption uh, on the side. <coughs> so that's pretty neat. I'll switch one more time so you can see the difference. And then you can also see quickly the, um, the debug mode. There we go. So you can see basically in X-rays uh, the, the, the dragon here. Uh, you can even see some hidden feature like these leaves, uh, probably that you couldn't see be, be without the, this debug mode. And um, one thing I wanted to mention about this as well is that we are talking about transparency because this is the most obvious cases. But of course, it can be used with opaque object uh, to do uh, um, a custom effect like, for example, the X-rays or any other crazy thing uh, you, might, you might think about. So same for a technical artist. Uh, so you have access to Shader Graph, which is also compatible now with uh, uh, almost every HDRP features. Uh, so you have access to tessellation. You can do custom motion vectors. Uh, you have access to all the lighting models as well that you can even choose later on uh, on your materials. We have a, a deep integration in, in VFX graph. We have lens flares that we will talk about, uh, screen space lens flares and, uh, and SRP lens flares. We have a physical camera which goes together with a physical base lighting. Basically, if you, if you, take a, if you set up a room with the right, the, the real values on the bulbs, or you can actually have IES profiles to exactly have the same, uh, the same cookie, and you can look at the value in Lumen. You, you set up the room the same way, you take a picture, you take the parameters of the camera, you put it in the physical camera, you will get exactly the same lighting in HDRP. Um, so we have this with advanced depth of field, which I don't recommend in games at all. Um, and, um, and we have also color monitors to help you do color grading uh, there. We also, like we wanted really to give access to as many things as possible through shader graph. So we have custom passes, for example, so which will allow you to, to integrate yourself into the HDRP pipeline uh, at each step. And you can use Shadow Graph to do this. Um, you have a lot of samples, again, in this magical thing, HDRP package samples, um, where you can see how to use it to do outlines, to do uh, screen space uh, uh, like drops on the, on the camera lens, and so on. Uh, it's a great way to start. And then finally, 
We can even, like as a technical artist, you can even integrate yourself into the fog with volumetric materials. So you can create a local fog volume and create a procedural fog to do a ground fog which would match your ground or something like a, uh, like, uh, yeah, like effect in the, in the skies and so on. Uh, so yeah, Mathieu was talking about fog. Uh, you can do uh, indeed um, fog with code or shadow graph, but you can now in Unity 6 also use VFX graph to inject uh, some effect into the volumetric fog. So basically using uh, VFX graph as an input uh, for the volumetric fog. And as well, since I was uh, talking about the, um, the bridge between ray tracing and rasterization, we, we continue to, to, to add more support by adding support for the um, VFX graph. Uh, so basically, that means if you have an effect um, Without that pro anything uh, that pro emissive ball, for example, uh, ray trace global illumination will be able to pick up uh, those effects and basically bleed uh, those colors on the wall. Yeah, that's heavy, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Are you okay? And uh, then lens layer. Yeah. Uh, so in the the latest LTS, um, we had already what we call the SRP lens layer, which is a complete system uh, with full artistic control, meaning you can place your flare, uh, you can manage all your elements, as you can see on the on the animation. Uh, you can even render flare uh, that are off screen. Uh, so in Unity 6, we continue to improve this system by adding just more support, so XR support, uh, occlusion with other uh, HDRP features, so water, clouds, and we even added uh, more artistic control as well. Uh, but there was one thing that wasn't really addressed uh, with this system, is uh, the highlight uh, that we have on, on the car, so the specular highlight, for example, uh, because they don't really have a well-defined position in space, so you can't really place a flare there because they are view-dependent. Uh, so what we added in, in Unity 6 is what we call screen sparse lens flare, uh, which basically uses the, the bloom buffer, distort it multiple times, and then add it back on top. And with that, it gives you flare completely out of the box that can be used on top of SRP lens flare, or even used on its own, because, for example, if you do a, a, an open world or even a procedural world, uh, it might be too complicated to place flare for every single light in, your, in, in the game. So screen, screen space lens flare could be a, a solution for that. And I can even show you in the, in the project um, they are both available for URP and HDRP, by the way. Yes, that's a really good point. So let me find first uh, a specular highlight. Uh, there we go, we have a nice one. So as you can see, there is already the SRP lens flare uh, on the side, so you can see the caustic and the, and the part of the ring. Uh, but if I wanted to add, for example... And we can see it's off-screen also. Like it's, it gives you this cinematic look when it's off-screen. The light still shines through the light, even if it's outside. So it's just as easy as adding the override and adding the intensity to one, and then you will have uh, flares on specular highlight. So you don't have as much control as, as you have on the, on the SRP lens flare, but the good thing is that it works out of the box and it supports multiple type of flare. Uh, for example, I can, I can push uh, more flare. It even supports uh, streaks, uh, if I find this. Uh, so you, as you can see, I can remove it. I can even um, change its orientation depending on the, the smudge you have on your lens or anything you might uh, you might have in mind. It's a bit stronger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's a way stronger. <laughs> and um, yeah, Mathieu mentioned the cross pipeline thing. And um, since they are just post processes uh, working on top of each other, meaning they are compatible with the path tracer as well or any other uh, uh, renderer. So for the environment artist, same thing. We wanted that an environment artist can open Unity and just build the entire world. So we've improved the speed tree integration. So for example, we added a subsurface scattering mask, so which allows you with just one single material to render in at once an entire tree with different diffusion profiles between the, the leaves and the trunk. And also it allows the imposter, the last LOD of a tree, to exactly match the lighting of the, of the 3D tree. Um, we have decals, and here it's very interesting, it's a, it's a very advanced way. Um, we, there is a, a, a framework which is called a Surface Gradient Framework, which allows to combine multiple light maps on top of, uh, multiple, multiple displacement maps on top of each other to give uh, this uh, effect of micro, micro geometry that you want to combine. But once you start combining different maps on top of each other, it becomes a very complicated math mathematical problem. And one of uh, our employees who started at 14, and is my age now, uh, to think about it for the first time, made this, this framework, Surface Gradient Frameworks, which is now used in a lot of AAA games uh, to create these high-fidelity assets with just a few maps. 
Um, and so it, now it's like it's inter, inter, uh, in, entirely, sorry, uh, it's uh, the end of the day, uh, integrated into HDRP. For example, the decals are using this framework for you, so you don't need to set up anything. Um, and it's also used for the water system. Uh, so yeah, water system, uh, we, Remy will do a great demo. And uh, physical uh, sky with uh, support for night uh, now as well, so you can have full time of day. Volumetric clouds, where you, uh, you can choose between rendering the volumetric clouds in the skybox to be a bit cheaper, or locally so, so that you can fly through them. And, um, and volumetric fog, which is putting these different effects together um, so that you can create, for example, light shafts uh, through, the, through the clouds. So yeah, in, in the latest LTS, we, as you might know, we added the, the water system. So we, we wanted to have um, a robust system for just rendering and, uh, and controlling the appearance of the water system. And we also focused on performance, especially on, on console. Um, so it was already a pretty robust system. Uh, in Unity 6, we continue to improve this system by basically addressing all the specific needs that users might have when creating a game. Uh, so I will try to demonstrate the, the, the first three one at least uh, in the project. Uh, so the first, uh, oh, so let me remove this because <laughs> we can't see anything. Uh, the first thing um, that we really wanted to address is being able to make rivers. Uh, so in the project you might have not seen this morning, but there is actually m multiple rivers. Uh, this is one. What's this? Uh, it's, it's, you don't have to clean. Okay, it's fine. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so we needed three things uh, to be able to control rivers, uh, to make rivers. The first thing is currents. Uh, so let me find the river here. Uh, so each river has its own current, uh, as you can see. Let me. So the water will flow uh, in multiple direction, uh, as you can see here. You can see the. the the direction of the, of, the, of the flow of water. Uh, we also needed uh, deformation because uh, the river is not completely flat. Actually, let me, let me make the river uh, a little bit higher so you can see better. Oh, this is yeah. blowing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this is what the river looks like. And it's just actually just a, a water texture deformer with a, with a height map here uh, that actually deformed the river. And if I remove this, you see that it's just uh, a boring plane. And uh, <laughs> that's pretty much it. Uh, we also needed foam generator uh, that, that you can place directly in your word. Uh, they can use texture. They can use even procedural material. You can use a shadow graph to, to order them. And it follows the current, you know. It the follows the current and they generator. accumulate over time as well. Uh, so if I enable them back, uh, it will make more foam and more foam and more foam, depending on, on what you like. Uh, one other thing uh, we added is um, it's already pretty simple to add a water surface uh, in, your, in, your, in your scene, uh, but it was really hard to remove uh, water. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you really want to remove water. So for example, there's a, a boat here, and uh, you can see that there is water inside. Uh, so one quick fix would be to just duplicate this geometry and then convert this into a water excluder. And then if I take the water excluder, make it as a child, then it will follow the boat, uh, preventing water to render inside the boat. Uh, so that's uh, as easy as that. And one last thing I, I wanted to show you is um, underwater, uh, because that's something uh, a lot of the users ask us for. And we are a bit proud of it. So let me, there we go, find a proper angle. Uh, then let me find the ocean. And then it's as simple as just clicking underwater. And then you have underwater rendering with um, caustics that you can actually control, uh, remove, and, and change the, the tiling factor and everything. Uh, so as you can see, it's a pretty easy system. And we continue to improve it to make it more performant and uh, more uh, integrated into the pipeline. So now this, the, the water system sort properly with the cloud because they are both sort of transparent. Uh, so you can be above cloud and uh, see the water below the cloud. And you can also be underwater and see the cloud through the water. Uh, we also improve the post-processing uh, thing. So you saw the underwater, but you can actually uh, change the waterline uh, rendering onto the via a custom pass because we offer that possibility. And last thing we did, uh, we improved basically because, for example, if you want to do a gameplay interaction, you might want to know where uh, the height of the water is at a specific point. And in Unity, uh, in the latest LTS, we basically 
uh, replicate the simulation on the CPU, but now we allow a GPU readback uh, to be able to get uh, those, this water height at a really low cost with only a few frames delay. So in 90% of the case, you, you can't really see the difference. Uh, one other thing, <laughs> I'm back again. Uh, one other thing, so same as water, uh, basically, in, uh, in the latest LTS, we focused on having a performance system, uh, which, which was already the case. And in the latest, L in the Unity 6, we actually added more support. Uh, the first thing is the beer shadow map, which allows to have um, both the cloud layer, so that's the thing you can see above. Uh, so basically, cloud as a skybox, uh, and the volumetry cloud to be able to cast a shadow at the same time because before we were using a, a directional light cookie, uh, so we had to choose between, between both. And this also allows uh, to have volumetric cloud uh, cast shadows just below them, so this is the, the, the GIF that we are uh, showing here. And we also listened uh, a lot to our artists uh, that wanted a, a, um, a basically a third level of noise uh, into the clouds to basically have more erosion and more uh, cloud quality. Next, please. And last thing I wanted to talk to you about uh, is um, the sky, because uh, this, is, this is one of the things that uh, a lot of our users um, ask us for, uh, which is basically to, for us to support time of day. And for us to support time of day, we were missing actually a few pieces. Uh, the first one was the night sky, uh, which is actually two things. So the first thing is uh, the support of celestial bodies, so the moon and its phases. So as you can see here, uh, they are manually um, operated, but you can also uh, feed it the, the directional light. And then depending on its position, it will automatically update, which is pretty nice to see. And then uh, the second thing is the being, able to be, being able to customize the, the night sky, the sky, the PBR sky, directly into the shadow graph. Uh, so the most obvious use cases is adding uh, stars at night, but you can do basically anything. If you want to do polar light, for example, it's actually possible. Uh, the next missing piece is, is what we call atmospheric scattering, which is that blue light uh, that has been really exaggerated here uh, for it to, to be seen. Uh, that blue light that you can see at a distance, which is just basically light particle bouncing uh, onto small aerosol on the, on the atmosphere. And um, before, in, in, in the latest LTS, uh, it was actually kind of possible to do this, this effect, but we had to use fog or volumetric fog, uh, which is pretty costly. And since fog has a height limit, uh, we needed to push the fog really high. Um, and then you'd have less resolution for doing actual fog, so it was not really uh, really easy to use. So now it's just a checkbox onto the, um, onto the PBR sky uh, setting, and I will actually try to show you. So let me get back to the castle. Uh, something like here would do. So as you can see here, we actually use uh, volumetric fog <coughs> by default. Uh, so let me remove it. Uh, so as you can see now, that's that's pretty dull. And then we'll just have a checkbox here uh, that's called atmospheric scattering uh, that gives this effect back uh, at a way lower cost than volumetric fog. And then the, the cool thing is that now you can basically use your fog at a at a lower height because, for example, if I uh, try to add fog back and I want you to look at the cloud layer, uh, the the thing that are on top. Uh, that wouldn't be affected by uh, fog. And if I add atmospheric scattering on top of it, you can see that you get proper attenuation on top, uh, which was just basically not possible before. And one last cool thing uh, that really ties it together is um, proper ozone scattering, um, which is one of, one of the things that you, you, you didn't know you missed until you, you <laughs> see it. Uh, it's just a, a slight shift in you, uh, basically, uh, because it's responsible for a specific, really specific type of scattering because of its size uh, in the atmosphere and its density. And, and with all that and some optimization, uh, some memory optimization, uh, we can really say that we actually finally support time of day uh, in a GRP. It gives you, like, especially at the end of the day, if you don't have ozone layer, it really doesn't work because you, the, the light actually trans, tra, uh, transmits through a lot of atmosphere at this moment. And that gives a, a, a weird result for the eye. Um, and then finally, um, uh, for character artists, again, we want them to be ready to, to start with the fabric uh, shaders for the cloth with a skin shader, which now has also an, an option for a second lobe uh, so that simulates basically the oily layer on the, on the skin. So the first lobe simulates the, the skin diffusion and the second one, the oily layer on top. That's what makes a character re very photoreal. 
Um, again, it's like these advanced options. You like use them if you really have a short, uh, if you have a, a cinematic in your game, very short to the to the character. We have eyes uh, shader with also advanced options if you want really to go uh, nuts with, for example, simulation of caustics in the eyes. And for hair, we have uh, we have two uh, hair shaders. One which is uh, based on KGAK uh, parameterization, which is uh, like a manual parameterization where you can choose uh, manually almost every properties of the hair on the on on on, yeah, on the hair, and another one which is physically based, which matches the the properties of real hair or from animals or, or humans, which are very nice when you have strands hair. Um, but yeah, having strand strands hair right seems totally crazy in a game or in a real time application. But there were a lot of advancements uh, in the past, uh, which allowed to render hair in real time, actually. Uh, even in a game, you could see that on, on some AAA games. And so for this, we made a hair rasterizer, which is this micro engine inside of the engine dedicated to rendering lines uh, that, will, uh, that will solve three problems. One, the light scattering through the hair so that you have nice lighting. To um, the uh, the occlusions, because you you will render a lot of hair which is hidden uh, strands which are hidden be there be uh, on the back of the other ones, and then the third thing is uh, aliasing. So with this uh, rasterizer, this line renderer, basically you will be able to solve that. And um, if you want to import hair into HDRP, uh, you can. Uh, we have also an experimental package. Uh, for hair and fur simulation, which will allow you to procedurally generate uh, dynamic hair, where you control the curls and, and, and the stiffness of the hair, or you can import uh, a groom from a DCC through an alembic uh, with uh, the, the curves uh, support, so, which is a pretty standard way to import a groom. Okay, it's, we're almost there. So, oh wow, we were super fast. Yeah. So yeah, we Sorry. wanted to insist on uh, on the samples that Mathieu already talked about uh, because they've been we work a little bit in uh, in uh, in Unity six. So they they now use um, <coughs> cross pipeline shader. Uh, a lot of the assets between the pipelines uh, are actually shared. Uh, they each focus on a specific topic, uh, and they each show ways to 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 do things to do complex things in HDRP, and they include uh, lots of things. So texture, tutorial, uh, links to the documentation, uh, texture, post processes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You might not be able to do it because ah, yeah, we're offline. We're offline. Oh, that uh, uh, will work. Yeah, that worked. That worked. Okay. Uh, so yeah, they are available through the the, the package manager here. And the Eden. we already have a few. So there's material sample, transparency sample, the lens flare, uh, volumetrics that you've seen on the, on the slides, uh, full screen sample. We have um, water samples with rain, etc. And even more are coming uh, in the in the coming months. Uh, so there is that. Don't really hesitate to to use them uh, in your game uh, because we spend a lot of time with it. And um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and they are very nice to learn also. Yeah. Um, yeah, so if you want to start, you have the HDRP template. If you, if, because nobody makes film here, if you want to start, there is a Cinematic Studio template, which is a short film, uh, an entire short film uh, that you have access and you can modify it and so on. Um, we have the samples that uh, Remy was mentioning, and we have uh, a few demos uh, out there. We have the, the enemies demo. We have the, the heretic digital character, the Book of the Dead environment, if you want to, to get a lot of vegetation uh, from there. Same for the Unity terrain. We have the VFX graph uh, spaceship demo as well, if you want to see how to assemble like a most vertical of a, a first person uh, game. Uh, and a few samples as well as water samples. So that's it. We, oh, yeah, no. <laughs> and there is this very important uh, place that I mentioned also this, this afternoon. I hope people will jump on this. Is uh, resources.unity.com. You have tons of super valuable resources there. There is uh, an ebook for HDRP. Uh, there are ebooks for, uh, for VFX artists uh, and technical artists, which are very good. And what we try to do is to, it's like a real, you know, like I really love this, all these books about graphics and so on. So we try to update them. So you have, you had the 20 LTS version of the ebook and the 21 LTS and the 22 LTS. So that you always have like kind of the latest of the version that you're using. And each time we're adding like tips and tricks 
about how to use this, how to optimize that, and so on. Um, uh, you can use also, of course, learn.unity.com, and now uh, we announce today muse.unity.com. So we should have warned people to never watch this talk uh, in 2x. <laughs> that would be too dangerous. Um, so we even have time for questions, yeah. which is crazy. I'm, I'm super sorry to have gone that fast. Uh, it's my second talk and the demo. But I hope, like, we really wanted to get you to understand everything which is in HDRP. So uh, thanks a lot for not dying. Thank you. <laughs>